1 Corinthians 1. I'll spend a couple of weeks on these three verses. It's, it's Paul's salutation to the book of Corinthians. Uh, Paul writes in verse 1, Paul called an apostle, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and so Thanos, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those, this is my passage for today, uh, the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord, Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Then he writes, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to come back to my passage, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus. And who are they? Well, they are saints by calling. Who are they? They are all who in every place on the face of the earth call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Who are the sanctified in Christ? Those who call upon the name of the Lord. Th those who are saved. Now, it's one thing to be able to read that if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and on the third day raised from the dead, which according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 is a gospel, according to the scriptures, then every church age believer is sanctified. He's talking about the church of God here. Every believer, every church age believer is sanctified, sanctified, watch this now, in Christ Jesus, in him. We are sanctified in him. We are not sanctified anywhere else. We are sanctified in Christ. If, if, you, if you believe the gospel of Christ, you are sanctified in Christ. In Christ. In Christ. In Christ. That's a really important issue. That's a preposition. In Christ. The point that I want to make to you today is not that you're sanctified, but what does that mean to you? What does it mean to you? If you, if you believe the gospel of Christ, you're sanctified. But what does that mean? What in the world does that mean? And how important is that to your life? It's enormous. And people go, well, I, I believe I'm sanctified, but what does that mean? Okay, how does that change your life? If I'm sanctified in Christ, then how, how does sanctification change my life? If you don't know what it means, how does it change your life? I mean, how does that change my life? I am sanctified in Christ. Well, when he, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, they knew what he meant. They had been taught. They had two really good teachers in that church. They had Paul and they had Apollos. Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians 3, third chapter. And so when he lays this doctrinal term out that every believer in the church age is sanctified, and, and he, says, he says to them, to those who have been sanctified in Christ, saints by calling, with all who in every place call upon the name of the Lord. But they knew what that meant. They knew what that meant. My question to you is, do you? If I ask you to write a couple sentences on what it means to be sanctified in Christ, could you write anything? I mean, how knowledgeable are you of that? That's our subject today. I want you to be knowledgeable in your personal life of what that means. Okay? So let's have a word of prayer and we'll come back and we'll discuss this. What does it mean to be sanctified in Christ? I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living such as sanctified in Christ. You can't learn it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue or overt sins. These need to be confessed in silence and privacy so that your sanctification can work for you. 
you are sanctified so that sanctification can work for you. You don't work for it. It works for you. And one way it does is that when you confess your personal sins, according to 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. It restores you because you're sanctified. It restores you to the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. That is the work of sanctification. It is the work of sanctification. Two things work in 1 John 1, 9. The blood of Christ, which cleanses, and the Holy Spirit, which fills. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. So every time you confess your sin, whether you realize it or not, it is a work of sanctification working on your behalf through the blood and the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. And that's just one little aspect of what it work is all about. And so our Father, tonight we pause midweek lunch to thank you for your grace and the freedom that we have to assemble and the people that have a hunger for the word, not just for the food that nourishes their body, but the food that nourishes their soul. We pray, Father, that we would invite others to come and sit at the table of the Lord as well as the table, table of doctrinal studies. Encourage our hearts, Father, on what it means to be sanctified in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said in my prayer of introduction, uh, it works off from two avenues. You, you come into sanctification on two parts, the blood of Christ and the Holy Spirit sanctified. We'll see that today. And uh, and here we are in Paul's opening statement to the book of Corinth, Corinthians. I want to talk about four things about sanctification to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. The congregation, uh, when Paul wrote that, he just laid out a doctrinal term. He just threw a doctrinal term out there, which they understood the meaning of it. He doesn't go and explain it. He just says, to those who are sanctified in Christ. They go like, well, wow, I know what that means. Later, he's going to talk about how you live sanctification out. The whole book of Corinthians is about it. It's about the practical experience of it, of sanctification. I mean, it's a, it's a powerful doctrine that people don't understand. It's, it's just gigantic in your life. And I want you to be, I want you to be sure of that. And so he writes to the church of God, to the church age believers, at Corinth, local local area, one place where they called on the name of the Lord upon the face of the earth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ is saints by calling. Next Wednesday, I'm going to talk about what it means to be a saint by calling. And that'll be, a, that'll be of great interest to you. Now, where does this idea come? For uh, every place, those who call in the name of the Lord. It don't matter where you are, if you call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, the idea is talked about in Romans 10, 13. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. All right? It, that, By the way, that's taken from Joel, the second chapter, verse 28, and it's mentioned again in Acts 2, 21 at Pentecost. And people often go, well, where, does it, where do you get this idea? Whoever calls on the name of what It was Old Testament as well as New Testament. But sanctification worked different in the Old Testament than in the New Testament. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about that. I wrote those passages uh, and Paul's discussion of Romans 9 through 11 to the Jews. Uh, point number two, under the Old Covenant, that's you call it the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, sanctification was by shadow Christology. Shadow Christology. The blood, the blood of the animals represented the blood of Christ prophetically. It's called shadow Christology. 
Paul talks about it in great, or uh, whoever the writer of Hebrews is, the writer of Hebrews talks a great deal about this very fact in, in, in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. Um, it is well worth your read. In chapter 10, verse 1, he tells you, he calls it shadow Christology. The old covenant is shadow Christology. And there, there's great teaching on it out of the book of Hebrews. To give you an example of it, let me, let me read to you Galatians 3.8. I'll just turn over that real quick. Galatians 3.8, talking about shadow Christology, all of the, the tabernacle, the sacrifices, the blood of the goats and the calves and all that was a picture pointing towards the day when Christ would actually come and do all that, fulfill every bit of it. He said, I haven't come to abolish the law, I've come to fulfill it. Well, when you get to Galatians, the third chapter, you might ask yourself, well, how did people get saved in the Old Testament? Did they get saved in a different way than we get saved in the New Testament? The answer is no. They absolutely didn't. I want to show it to you in Galatians, the third chapter, verse 8, looking at Abraham, the father of the Jew and the father of faith, right? We know all that. Well, when you read verse 8, it says, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations shall be blessed in you, meaning Christ. This is going to be explained. Look, look now, verse 16. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say into seeds in a plural sense, but rather refers to one and to that seed, is Christ. Now that's called the prophetic gospel. How did people get saved in the Old Testament? They believed that one day Christ would come, die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead, fulfill all of the shadow Christology, fulfill every bit of it in his first coming, that related to his first coming. We're assured that if he fulfilled everything connected to his first coming, he will certainly fulfill everything connected to his second coming which they did not understand in the Old Testament nor in the Gospels until Jesus explains it later and the apostles did when Christ is raised from the dead and is seated at, God the, uh, uh, God, uh, at the right hand of God. So how we have a prophetic gospel uh, connected with the shadow Christology, connected with shadow Christology with a prophetic gospel, they're both prophetic, uh, looking for the day when Christ would come. Galatians 4.4 4 says there would be a day and there was a day when Christ came and we call it the day of incarnation. Now it lasted a pretty good period, but it's called the incarnation of Christ. Born to virgin, came, came through the womb into the world, etc. It's a powerful idea. Uh, and sanctification is behind all of this. Under the new covenant, under the new covenant, sanctification is by a historical gospel. It's not a prophetic gospel. It's a historical gospel. Jesus Christ came into the world. He died on a cross. There's a place, a date, and a time. He was buried three days later, raised from the dead. There's a place, time, records. We call it the historical gospel. Today, people are saved by a historical gospel. We talk about Jesus Christ dying on a cross on the hill called Golgotha. Uh, time and place. We celebrate Easter about a time and a place. It's a sunrise services in cemeteries all over the world. In 1 Corinthians 15, 3, 4, it says that Christ died according to the scripture. It's Old Testament. When he says the, the New Testament hadn't been completed yet when he said that. The scriptures with a capital S he's talking about is the Old Testament. That he, Christ died according to the scriptures. Isaiah 52 and 53 and Psalms 22 and, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, Psalm 16, 8 through 10, he'll be raised from the dead. No. According to the scriptures, he will be buried and raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And if he doesn't go by the scriptures, then he's not the Messiah. 
if he goes by this way of the scriptures, he is the Messiah. He's got to die according to the scriptures. He's got to be buried according to the scriptures. He's got to be raised according to the scriptures. Right? According to the scriptures. And he, and he was. You know, nobody argued that. <laughs> nobody argues that. And so, according to the scriptures, like in Hebrews 9, 14, and 15, it says, if you like the blood of goats and, 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 goats and, and, and calves, then how much more the blood of Christ? Because that was the shadow of the substance that would come and complete it. That, that system had to go until Christ came and completed this system. Now, it's, there is an end to that. We don't do that anymore. You can keep your little lamb. See, do, see, do. You can keep it. In Hebrews 10.1, it talks about shadow Christology. It talks about shadow Christology. And here's what's interesting. When you read the four verses that go with chapter 10, you know, like one, two, three, four. What is interesting, it talks about the shadow. Watch me now. You remember when there used to be a program on the radio called The Shadow? I dated you right there, buddy. Yeah, I, you said yes, then went no right away, because we know it. Listen, this Hebrews 10 was talking about shadow Christ. It talks about the shadow, watch this now, of the good things to come. The shadow of the good things to come. What was that? The Messiah. The good things of the Messiah. The good things. In Hebrews 10.10 10 on your paper, talking about the gospel, by this, if you read chapter 10, by this we have been sanctified. We have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once. For what? For all. Once for all. We use that phrase a lot, don't we, in life? Once for all. That's a common phrase. But in the Bible, it's dynamite. Once for all. In Hebrews 9.12, which I didn't put on your paper, you might write, this, write it down, Hebrews 9.12. Not through the blood of goats and calves, that's shadow Christology, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place, heaven, once for all. That writer likes that phrase. Having obtained eternal redemption. There's your once saved, always saved. E eternal redemption. I know that can't be mine. I turned mine off. <laughs> Vibrating. <laughs> Hebrews 10, <laughs> Hebrews 10, 14. The hammer, I guess, will work. It did for the Clintons. I don't know if it worked for me or not. It worked for them. Hebrews 10, 14. By what offering? How many? For by what offering? He has perfected, completed, finished. Teleestai, finished. The, the work of eternal redemption was finished once for all when he died on that cross. By what offering? He is perfected for how much? For all time. Those who are what? Sanctified. Sanctified. Those who are sanctified. See, that's what the writer is telling us in 1 Corinthians 1 2. Listen to this again. I'm going to read this one again. To those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call in the name of the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Why? Why is it important they call upon the name of the Lord? Right? Here it is. Write this down, because it's not on your paper. I expect you to do a little something. Okay. Philippians 2, 6 through 11. And here's what's interesting. Philippians 2. Now, you know this passage, but you don't pay attention to it. You know this passage. Every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Whether you're in heaven 
or on earth or under the earth. How about that? Sheol. Under the earth. But you know what it all, it, what it all hinges on? All that bow your knee and confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord? You know what that's all based on? One phrase. Listen to this. By the obedience to his death, the death of the cross. You know where what he's saying is that it when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, when it comes to the cross of Jesus Christ, and the man hunging on it, because there are three cross there were three crosses there. The one, the man who is the eternal picture of eternal redemption. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Jesus, that he is Christ, and that he is Lord. Lord. You know why he's called Lord? Because he was raised from the dead and seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. You know what's interesting about the Old Testament? When they said that, Joel 2.28, when they said that, they used the word Lord because they didn't know it was going to be Jesus Christ. They didn't know. They knew it would be Christ, but they didn't know it was Jesus, right? Until his birth, you'll call his name Jesus. But you know why Lord? Lord is because of sanctification. Lord is all about sanctification. Jesus, he's got to take humanity. Christ, he's got to be prophetic. Lord, he dies, he's buried, and he's raised from the dead. Seated back, seated back in heaven at the right hand of the Father as Lord God. And there is where sanctification is because you are sanctified where? In Christ Jesus. Where is he? Where is he? Seated on the throne in the third heaven. That's where your sanctification, your feet are on earth. You just went to the cross, believed that he died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. You believe that, and you got you got sanctified in him who is seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. Who holds eternal redemption. And you're part of that. Sanctified. Did you know all that? Yeah, well, good. So, what in the New Testament makes this different sanctification in the New Testament, because they, sancti they sanctified everything in the Old Testament that had shadow Christology. They sanctified the tabernacle, the temple, the everything connected, the lambs, uh, everything. Driving me crazy. Uh, maybe the Clintons had the right idea. Take the hammer. <laughs> uh, then it that it, it'd be in the cloud somewhere. I, I understand. I don't know. What's the difference in the new covenant as a different as different from the old testament? Here it is. I wrote on your paper up in, on the I'm on the back page at the very top. Circle this word "baptized" by the Holy Spirit. The difference is that in the new covenant, it is the blood of Christ that brings you into sanctification. And it is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that places you in Christ and places the Holy Spirit in you, which is the dynamics of sanctification. It's the dynamics. Listen to 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning. Mm. That, that's okay, but that's not really what it says. That word in the Greek language is first fruit. It's A P A R C H E. Up R K. It's A P A R C H E, if you're just interested. It's first fruit. It's first fruit. And the subject is sanctification. Beginning, watch this now. The beginning, the first fruit. Now, Jesus is called the first fruit. 
of those who are slept. He's talked about resurrection. The resurrection of Christ, the first fruit. Jesus Christ is the first fruits, which connects him to Lord, the Lordship, seated at the right hand of God the Father. And when he would do that, he would send back the Holy Spirit. All right. These two are connected. These two are connected, and it's connected by a very popular, popular idea with, with the Messiah, and that is salvation and sanctification. Here's what he says. Because God has chosen you from the beginning, or as from first fruits. Look. <laughs> First fruits is, is where Christ was raised from the dead. That was a Jewish holiday. Fifty days later, you have Pentecost, which brought the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, the, the speaking in tongues, all that was all connected to it. That we call it Pentecost. But the, the first fruits of Pentecost, 50 days, two, two holidays connected uh, to Passover in the Bible. God has chosen you from the, and so that's what he means by this. But he, he didn't really say from the beginning. He said from first fruits, which make, make, puts it all together scripturally. From the beginning, for, sal for salvation, for salvation, through saint watch this, through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The glory. Now listen. Sanctification, a salvation sanctification comes through the blood of Christ and by baptism of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? Salvation comes by the blood and the baptism. Comes by the blood of Christ, comes through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And what does that bring to you? What does sanctification bring? Watch this now. What does it bring to you? Listen to me what it brings to your life. The glory of God. That's divine. The glory of God. The sanctif sanctification brings you the glory of God. Now, let me tell you what sanctification means. Here, here is the word. I, well, I wrote it on your paper. It's probably my next point. L let me just finish this. It's in my next point. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. If you want to know drinking of one spirit, that's John 7, 37 through 39. That well within inside of us. You see, when the Holy Spirit took, took up residence within us, we all have the same well. Right? Thirsty souls. It satisfies you and it satisfies others who come to you because you have the answer to the hungry, thirsty souls. You have the answer. Certainly you have the answer of the gospel, don't you? And people are are starved and they're thirsty for the righteousness of God, which is imputed to you just like sanctification. These are gifts of your salvation. The blood and the baptism of Christ are important to sanctification. We are all baptized into one body, right? And, uh, and are all made to drink of the one spirit. All right? Now, point number three. Sanctified is a verb. It's H-A-G-I-A-Z-O. That, that is the word sanctified. Hagiazo. That's the word sanctified. Now watch this. That's a verb. When you look for the noun, adjective or noun, it is the word hagias. hagias and notice... <laughs> they're the same word. One's a verb, one's, one's a noun or adjective. Same word. Now watch. In our passage, in our passage, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, this is called sanctified. That's called sanctified. This is called saint. In the English, same word. Because these two are absolutely connected. If you are sanctified, you're a saint. They're both gifts. They're gifts of your salvation. And they're given to you by the blood of Christ and by the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
How about that? Now let me tell you something else that's interesting. In our passage, 1 Corinthians 1, 2, the word hegeazo, sanctified, you know, sanctified, is a perfect passive participle. There you go, like, okay, so what's that mean? Oh, 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 let me tell you what it means. The perfect tense in the Greek language means that something's been completed in the past with the results it remains completed forever. So what's the subject? Sanctified. How am I sanctified? I believe the gospel of Christ, that he died for my sins personally, he was raised, raised and from the dead, seated at right hand of God the Father, death, burial, resurrection. Agreed? In the past, the moment I believe, the moment I believe that his work is sufficient to save me, the moment I believe that, for by grace are you saved through faith, not if yourself is a gift to God, I am sanctified. And I am sanctified from that point forever. Because of the past point of Christ dying on the cross, being buried and raised from the dead. Right? Look at He dies for my sin, he's buried, he's raised from the dead. That's, God, that's the gospel. When I believe that, I am sanctified in the perfect tense. I didn't create that. God created the perfect tense. I didn't create that. I didn't put it down there. He put it down there. He said, you're sanctified. Here, here's what he says. Here's what perfect tense says. You are sanctified in Christ for how long? Forever. Once sanctified, always sanctified. Because it's a gift. You didn't earn it, didn't deserve it. It was given to you by the grace of God. It's one of 50 things you receive at salvation you can never lose in time and eternity because of God's grace. Because of God's grace. For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself as a gift of God. The passive voice of the word sanctified, the passive voice is the voice of grace, meaning the, the, that the subject didn't do anything to deserve it or earn it. It was given to them. Sanctification is a gift. It's not earned, it's not deserved, and you cannot lose it. It's what? How long? It's forever. How do I know it? Perfect tense. How do I know it's grace? Passive voice. Participle. It's a doctrinal principle that's unique to the church age because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and because Jesus Christ brought shadow, brought the salvation out of the shadow into the public square. Oh, you should be so thankful. You should be so thankful. Hegias means to be separated. Watch this now. I mean, here's the word sanctified. Here's hegiazo. Here's what it means. It means to be separated from something that was preventing you to be connected to the holiness of God. See, the word is holy. This word hegias, saint, th th means holy. This is holy. Holy, holy, holy is my God. This is the word holy. Holy in the Greek language. It's called sanctified. It's called saint. It's called holy. The holy scriptures. The Holy Spirit. This is the word hagias. In the Greek. Here's what hagiazo means. It means to be separated unto the holiness of God by being made the holiness of God through the faith in the gospel and being baptized into Christ. Watch this now. The moment you believe the gospel, right here, you believe the gospel, you are baptized by the Holy Spirit into Christ. That's, we call that, listen to what theology, it's called positional sanctification. It's called positional, we have a term for it in theology. At least we do in conservative theology. It's called positional sanctification. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, you are baptized into Christ. We call it positional sanctification. That's the perfect passive participle of hegeos, hegeazo. That's what it is. 
absolutely what it is. Don't let anybody lie to you. I've laid it out to you. And when they tell you that, well, how are you going to explain the perfect passive participle of 1 Corinthians 1 2? And they'd be hard pressed to tell you. And don't let them tell you unless they can show you what they mean by the perfect tense in the, in the grammar of the Greek. People say to me, Ron Adema, why do you always teach from the languages? Why do you teach? This is why you can't, you can't refute a perfect tense. I'm telling you what the textbook tells you. So don't let people lie to you about it. And so I explained to you in some detail the perfect tense is completed action in the past it remains completed forever. The passive voice is the voice of grace and the participle is the doctrinal principle of the new covenant. What does that mean to you? You should write this down in your paper. Once sanctified in Christ, always sanctified in Christ. That's the perfect passive participle. <laughs> Once sanctified in Christ, always sanctified in Christ. There will be a day in your life when you won't be sanctified in Christ. Set apart unto God's holiness and made holy by His grace. You can't earn it. You can't lose it. It operates under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's, you're baptized in it. He's brought into you in it, and that is the power of saying living in the power of the Holy Spirit is living out the doctrine of sanctification. It is living a holy life for God. It's not, listen, it's by the power of the Spirit, not the flesh. So many people in Christianity are trying to be holy by their own effort. Well, I do this and I do that and I do that. Yes, but do you walk in the power of the Spirit? Because if you don't, all this other doing stuff is for naught. It's not done in the flesh. It's done in the power of the Holy Spirit. We live in the church age. This is the new covenant. And you've been saved to be holy. Listen, it's not an effort. You don't have to beat yourself up. You have to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. You've got a Galatians 5.16. You've got to walk in the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And you fulfill, you fulfill sanctification by doing it. It's the application or experiential sanctification. It is the ability to live the life that God has chosen you for. The life of holiness or divine principle. Living by the divine structure. It's it's not hard to do. It's impossible due to the flesh. It's impossible not to do it in the spirit. Right? It's possible in the spirit and impossible in the flesh. I don't know if I said that right or not. Uh, it was like coming back to my head. He said, I think you got that wrong. I went, well, let me clear it up. All right? Sanctified in Christ. Here's my final point. Sanctified in Christ is a foundation doctrine of your salvation. You must learn this. That's not the only one. There are 50 other. <laughs> there are 49 more. <laughs> but this is a biggie. You know why? Because the word itself means to be to have your life set aside under the holiness of God. You see, what prevents that is not being in Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in sanctification. Right? The issue... It's not your position in Christ tonight. I want you, I want you to know that's secured by the grace of God. Your, your sanctification in Christ is secured. I don't let anybody lie to you. It's secured. Just remember that passage and how it's used. But listen, experiential sanctification is an issue, a volitional issue. Are you letting the Holy Spirit who lives in you live the life of God out of you? That's sanctification. That's experiential sanctification. Let the life that God has chosen for you, let it be lived out where other people can touch, feel, and sense it. Live your life. Live sanctification out in the presence of other people. How do I do that? You do it by grace. You do it by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. You walk in the Spirit in Galatians 5.16. You don't walk in the flesh. You walk in the Spirit. And listen, listen, you can win that battle. It's in your head. You can win that battle. That battle's in your head. Stop walking in the flesh. Start walking in the Spirit. Why do you, why do you always want to please yourself and not God? That inner dialogue? 
Well, I've had enough of that. I'm not going to take that any longer. I, I set up. I, 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 who are you talking to? Yeah, I'm talking to the Lord. He doesn't get fed up. If he did, this thing would be over a long time ago. Who are you talking to? You're not talking to the Lord. You're talking to yourself. You're talking to your flesh. Give it up. There's nothing to win in the flesh. That's a war that can be done away with. You're in control of that war. Give it up. Give that thing up. Sanctification. Sanctified in Christ is one of 50 foundation doctrines of the package of salvation. Be sure you, if somebody brought you here, make sure they give you a little pamphlet on that. Sanctified in Christ means to be separated from something that's preventing God's holiness, like Adam's sin if you're not saved, to something able to make one holy, that's salvation, and then the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. It's the only way. That's the only way. There is no sanctification apart from faith in Christ. How much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works, never works. N dead works never works, right? How come your husband don't go to work? Because he's dead. Oh, I see when you're mad because he don't bring a paycheck home. Maybe, maybe you should just take him out of the living room and bury him. If he's dead, maybe you ought to do it officially, though. Cleanse your conscience. Cleanse your conscience. That's where you think and live. From dead works to serve a living God. So, you put this on the board. There's positional sanctification. I've given you a ton of scriptures today. Next week when we come back to this wonderful food and time together. <laughs> I will talk to you about what it means to be a saint by calling. You know, I keep here, people keep talking about themselves. They're saved. They know they're saved. And they still refer to themselves as a sinner. Well, why would you call yourself a sinner? How come you never call yourself a saint? Oh, I, oh, oh my goodness. I could never refer to myself as a saint. How is that possible? Every, God does. The Bible does. So let's talk about that next week out of this passage. Saints by calling. My wife's favorite football team. Saints. I said to her, why do you like it? How could I not root for a team called the Saints? I said, well, what do I know? I like Green Bay, but they're not the Saints. So how can I sit there and say, well, what? I'm rooting for Green Bay, and she goes, no Christian would root for them when they're playing the saints. Can't argue with logic, I guess. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way and the ladies who provide a wonderful meal. Pray, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of sanctification in Christ, the positional part of it and the experiential part of it. I pray, Father, that this would be an enlightening to our souls, both to those who have tended today by automobile and those by the Internet. I pray, Father, once again, that the truth of God would ring clear and set us free from the cosmic system so that we might live a righteous life, a holy life in Christ, not by our own efforts and not certainly not by the flesh, but by the grace of God through the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.